Uh, good evening. Welcome to the public lecture uh, organized by the Institute for Mathematical Sciences, uh, National University of Singapore. Um, this public lecture is uh, generous, generously supported by the Nkong Bank Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, and this evening, I'm very pleased that we have Professor Caroline Series from the University of Warwick to deliver the lecture. Professor Series uh, was educated at Oxford and received her PhD from Harvard University. And uh, after that, she spent a few years in the United States before returning to uh, Britain uh, and began her career as a lecturer at the Univers University of Warwick and eventually subsequently became a uh, full professor. A few, uh, in 1989, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. And she was uh, invited to the International Congress of Mathematicians as a speaker in 1986. Uh, the International Congress was organized at Berkeley, uh, in Berkeley that year. And Professor Series works in the area of uh, hyperbolic geometry, uh, specifically hyperbolic three manifolds, uh, Kleinian groups, and dynamical systems. She has won many significant awards, including the Junior Whitehead Prize and also the Senior N. Bennett Prize, both from the London Mathematical Society. She's a fellow of the Royal Society and also a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. And Professor Series was a founding member of uh, the uh, committee uh, called European Women in Mathematics. And she was also the vice president of the Committee on Women in Mathematics of the uh, International Mathematical Union. So without further ado, uh, may I in invite Professor Series to deliver her lecture. The title is Indra's Perks, A Mathematical Adventure. Professor Series, please. Right, well, I hope everyone can hear me. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, very nice. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be, well, not here, and it is an absolute miracle of technology that I can be sitting in England many thousands of miles away from you, and I hope you can all hear and see what I'm going to be showing you. So I'm going to be talking about a book called Indra's Pearls. Contrary to the title, it is actually a mathematics book but it's a mathematics book that's not like your average book. It's trying to uh, explain some very beautiful things which are really at the cutting edge of mathematics, but in such a manner that I hope everyone who's here this evening will be able to understand something about. So this is a book. Um, let me first of all explain. The subtitle of the book is The Vision of Felix Klein. Well, who was Felix Klein? He was a leading mathematician in Germany. In fact, one of the leading mathematicians in the world uh, in the, as you see, in the sort of late parts of the 19th century, early 20th century in Göttingen in Germany. And he wrote a very famous book with a long title in German uh, written on the slide, which, which translates as uh, lectures on the theory of automorphic functions. But the main point I want to say about the book this evening is that it has some very remarkable pictures like the one on the right. And this picture, believe it or not, was drawn by hand. Uh, and what I want to do today is explain what the kind of pictures which were in Klein's book were about, how one can actually program a computer to make them, and then explore what we get. So this is what the book Indra's Pearls is all about. So how did it come about? Well, David Mumford, who you see down here, who's one of the most um, famous mathematicians in the world, won the Fields Medal, the top prize in mathematics in 1974. He, in the early 1980s, 
decided to go back to the kind of pictures which were in Klein's book and try to start programming some computer explorations of them. And rather than trying to do this alone, he enlisted David Wright, who you see in this picture drawn by, painted by one of his daughters, um, who at that time was a student at Harvard University. And he not only was studying number theory, but he loved playing with computers. And together they embarked on a systematic study of these pictures. Much later on, in fact, um, probably 10 years later on, I became interested in their results. I saw some of the pictures. Uh, I became fascinated by them. I think I wrote one brief article about it and I was invited by David then to join in with them to write this book. So what's the book about? Well, the first chapter of the book is talking about symmetry. Now, Felix Klein gave an extremely famous lecture um, when he first became a professor in the University of Göttingen. And he really explained a new view of symmetry. He explained that you could talk about symmetry in terms of shapes or patterns which remain unchanged when you repeat or iterate some kind of thing which mathematicians call a map or a transformation over and over again. And the innovation about all this was that one could use many sorts of maps beyond the ones that we know from Euclidean geometry. So here is a picture um, based on Euclidean geometry. Of course, the people who made this weren't aware of Euclid, but you can see it's very beautiful translational symmetry of the kind you probably have studied at some point. And how do you get a pattern like this? Well, you do the same thing over and over again, either moving vertically or horizontally as you go. So that's what um, familiar kind of symmetry is like. And this is how you should think about a mapping. So this is what the mathematicians um, talk about. So you put in to your computer or your calculation, the coordinates of a point, an input somewhere, and you have a formula which gives you a new point, which is the output. So in this simple example, um, you see there is a man, a red man, and every point on him is moved one unit to the right. And you can go backwards, you take the red man and you move him, every point on him, one unit to the left. And obviously you can figure out how to write that down in ordinary X, Y coordinates. So the point of this book and actually Klein's book was talking about a somewhat more elaborate form of mapping called Merbius maps. And they're otherwise known as linear fractional transformations. And these are named for August Merbius, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of the Merbius band, the same Merbius. And the best way to express these mappings is in terms of complex numbers. So we have to do, let's have a little digression about what complex numbers are. So a complex number is one that involves the square root of minus one, and think of it just as a convenient way of representing a point with x, y coordinates. So we write it down x plus square root minus one y, and we think of the x coordinates <clears throat> as being horizontal and the y coordinate as being vertical, <clears throat> but we multiply all the y ones by this square root of minus one, which enables us very conveniently to write down the formulas we want. So here's a little picture, I should say, I think almost all the pictures I'm going to show are actually pictures out of our book. Not quite, but almost all. Here is a picture, um, <clears throat> as we explain in chapter two of the book, more about complex numbers. So you can see every point in the grid has got um, an X and a Y, and we've got these square root of minus one's I's in there. Um, the sort of shorthand telling us which is the horizontal and which is the vertical. So just a shorthand. So if we want to translate horizontally, we send 
uh, <coughs> x plus i y to we write z instead of x plus i y and then we send z to z plus one that moves us one to the right but if we move z to z plus i that moves us one upwards in the picture so the great thing about complex numbers that's not really very interesting the good thing is that we can not only add and subtract these they're kind of vectors but unlike what you normally do with vectors you can multiply and divide them and the only rule you have to remember is that you square multiply the square root of minus one by itself and you get minus one so a complex number think of it as something with a length and a direction and if you multiply by a complex number this was the great discovery in the um very end of the 18th, early 19th, uh, sorry, end of the 17th, early, so early 19th century. Um, if you multiply by a complex number, you can work out that it has the effect of expanding by a factor of the length of the thing you're multiplying by and rotating by the angle. So if I want to multiply by this number z, I multiply everything by the length of the vector representing z and I rotate it by the angle theta. So this picture with blue dots uh, on the right gets rotated, expanded and rotated through 45 degrees into these red dots. So that's how complex numbers work. And that's going to be the algebra we're going to use. So here's another one. We start with a fox uh, and the red is the fox, and we are showing the effect of multiplying him by all sorts of different complex numbers. And as you can see, you get nice, you can expand and contract things, and you can also rotate them. So <clears throat> already this produces some nice spirals. If we keep multiplying by the same complex number, we successively get bigger or smaller, and we also spiral around depending on what the rotation angle is. So that it's the very beginning of a hint that we may get some more interesting kind of patterns by doing this than we do by normal Euclidean translations. So we need to consider one more kind of transformations to get to Mobius maps and then we can start properly. So uh, we need to understand what the effect of taking a number and doing one over it is. And here's a picture. Uh, what happens is you have to take, for example, the orange fox, you have to scale him by a factor of one over the length of z and reflect um, in, well, here we're reflecting in the circle. So down in blue at the bottom is written the exact formulas. So it's a bit hard to take that in if you haven't seen it before, but it's quite an easy process to do um, and it produces yet more interesting pictures. So we put all this together, we find we're looking at any map that can be expressed by the formula, Z goes to C, C, D, E, and F or any complex numbers, and we express them by a formula CZ plus D over EZ plus X. So it's something a computer can be easily programmed to do. So these maps have some nice properties. They alter distance, but they keep angles the same. So if you take the red square grid on the left inside the circle, you take the map Z goes to one over Z and it gets distorted into this curvilinear grid. So, but notice all the squares in the curvilinear grid, they're, they're kind of square because they still have right angles um, in the, corners. There's another picture on the right where you see how various shapes have been distorted as they move along the spiral given by multiplication by some Mobius map. Right, so let's look at the effect of iterating. So on the left we've got just ordinary Euclidean symmetry. On the right, in this nice little video made by David Wright, we're seeing the analog of repeating a single Mobius map over and over again. And what you can see is that this little man 
um, he keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and he's kind of vanishing into a black hole um, on the right hand side of the picture. I'm not sure the video shows it, but if you go backwards, he would move around. In, yeah, here we go. He's going backwards. So now we're doing it backwards and he is vanishing into another black hole on the other end of the spiral. So let's keep going. Here's another way of thinking about it. So map, these maps, one of their important properties is they send circles to circles. So in this picture, we've got two blue circles and the map that I'm calling little a, it sends all the stuff that's outside the left-hand blue disc and it pushes it forwards inside the right-hand blue disc, D sub little a. And if you do it again, it pushes the stuff that's inside D little a into the yellow circle inside. And notice that these aren't concentric circles, but every time you repeat the map on the right, stuff gets squashed down into a further circle. And, oh, I'm sorry. Um, if you did it backwards, which I'm going to call D capital A, you would push back in the other direction to the left-hand circles. Uh, so you can do a little bit of algebra to work out that there are indeed two points which don't get changed by this map. And uh, those ones are the intersection points of all these little tiny circles. Well, just think about the picture though, and now we'll see what we can actually do with it. Now we get to something really, um, interesting. Let's start with two pairs of circles like this and let's do these pushing maps uh, from D capital A to D little a and D capital B to D little b and we're using this shorthand when we do capital A's it means we do backwards of A. When we do capital B we're going backwards of B just to make the pictures easier to draw and let's ask the question what happens when you do this over and over again. We saw what happened with two circles. What happens when you've got four circles? So here we are, we've got four circles. And if we push everything, let's say out of the circle labeled capital A, outside the circle called capital A, it lands inside the circle called little a. And what was outside capital A? Well, there were three red circles. So those three red circles get pushed inside the red circle labeled little a. And just about, you can see red, three yellow circles in there. Actually, I'd have done better to talk about the circle capital B. Everything that's outside the circle capital B gets pushed inside the circle labeled little b, so three red circles, capital A, little a, and little b get inside circle labeled b, and the circles get labels accordingly. So the labels are just keeping track of uh, what you get when you push. So we do it again. We do it again and we've dropped now in this second picture, the red circles, just to make the picture a bit plainer, but the process repeats. Inside each yellow circle, there are three more little green circles if you work it out and they all have labels and you can work out a system for labeling them. And you do it again and you drop the yellow circles and you get three more dots and you get three more little blue circles at the level four and you can keep going. So you just keep going, you keep doing this iteration. So we're doing one opera or two operations. We match two pairs of circles and we just keep doing it over and over again. And we end up with some rather remarkable picture, which is called the limit set of this iteration process. So if you see this place that's uh, marked zoom in the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, what you see when you zoom into there for the modern meaning of zoom. Um, 
So just to say for the mathematicians, of course, the collection of all these maps, we're allowing the map and its inverse. So actually this whole collection is called a group, but we don't really need to get into group theory particularly, except that um, it was mentioned in the introduction, I think that one of the things I work on are Kleinian groups. Well, here is a Kleinian group. It's a, an iteration by Mobius maps in its simplest incarnation. So uh, this is a picture showing you a zoom. So you took this little tiny patch on the left and you blow it up and you keep going. And of course you can do this with a computer. You keep going and you see exactly the same thing again. And if you zoomed in further, you would see the same thing again. And that's what is actually known as a fractal. So we'll see a bit more of that in a moment. Uh, here is a picture. I think this picture is truly remarkable. This picture, um, it wasn't in Klein's book, but in the University of Göttingen in the mathematics department, they have a collection of beautiful original drawings, which I was lucky enough to be able to see. So this is one of the pictures um, drawn by one of Klein's students who was a draftsman. So remember this is in the late 19th century, sort of 1890s or so, um, just all drawn by hand. And it is remarkably like the pictures that we get by computer. It's not, it's all calculated, it's not just, any old scribble. Here is a modern version made by Dave Wright. Um, he's taken three circles to match up and he's gone to a deeper level. And an interesting thing to note um, that you can see some of these blue circles themselves seem to lie on circles and that phenomenon is something we shall come back to in a little bit. Um, right, so you can actually do the same thing, but make your initial pairs of circles actually touch, be tangent to each other. And then what happens is all the future circles that you get touch each other and you get a chain of circles and an inner chain of circles and an inner chain of circles and so on. So uh, a little bit for the mathematicians on the right, um, you have to make the commutator be parabolic, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, but you see, if you compare this picture on the left to the picture on the right, in fact, if you blow up the picture on the left, you see it's yet more astonishingly close. I think Dave Wright has actually managed to reproduce a picture which really looks like the one on the right. So what did um, Mumford and Wright really want to do? Once they'd made a few pictures, they wanted to set up computer programs which could systematically do this. So they want to take two Mobius maps, let's call them capital A and capital B, or little a and little b, perhaps I should say. And they want to be able to feed in some small amount of initial data and make a picture. Now, the first thing to do is you make a picture called the word tree, which represents all the iterations or combinations of these maps that you have to uh, use. And as you can see, you can arrange them very nicely. You can think of this as circles. You see, here's a picture on the right, which is uh, start with the figure, big figure in the middle. And the, uh, the figure is being pushed into successive circles in exactly the same pattern as the schematic word tree on the left. And the word tree, the stuff around the edge, it has, as you can see, we've learned something about exponential growth in the last year. The number of things that you have to consider at each successive level grows exponentially. So very fast things get very small. So you can see here he is, this Dr. Stickler, as we call him throughout the book, um, using him to illustrate these different motions. Here he is getting very small as we push him in. So this is a movie showing the picture I showed with the um, circles touching each other, but this shows actually how the Mumford Wright algorithm would plot this picture. So what's happening on the left is it's going round 
the outside of the word tree, plotting the images of the original circles under these various combinations, iterations of uh, maps. And on the right, I don't know that you can see, but the right hand side is a blow up of the region just around one of the tangency points of the four red circles. And as you can see, you get a very beautiful pattern that's kind of repeating itself. You could blow into there, uh, zoom into there again and uh, see more and more detail. So here we go, we're going to see, now here is a picture where they've actually let go of the requirement or let go of the original circles and they're just plotting what you see, what the limit set is or the black holes are um, when you've gone very deeply into the iteration. So this is after iterating some very large number of times in the book, we explain various ways and various tricks whereby you can now, now we're going to zoom in. Um, so this is what I mean by saying that this picture is a fractal. You can keep zooming and zooming and however long you zoom for, you get almost the same effect. So you never come to anything that looks like a straight line. You still see a very complicated curve, but it still has this beautiful kind of uh, symmetrical. You feel it's symmetrical, even though you don't quite know how to put your fingers on uh, what the symmetry is. So here's another picture in which the algorithm comes out with a pattern that you really wouldn't expect. And I don't think Mumford and Wright expected these patterns at all. But as you see, as this curve goes round and around and around, it is completely miraculously creating a very complicated picture of tangent circles. And it was some of these pictures which I saw, not, not in the movie form, but which started to fascinate me as well. And what they discovered was that for each rational number, actually, you can create one of these beautiful patterns um, Nobody could really explain to me why, and that's what I spent a number of years trying to understand. But roughly speaking, anyway, you give a rational number and they can make you a beautiful picture. Let's say that. So, but I haven't said anything yet about how you should set about exploring systematically. So let's think about that for a bit. How should you choose your two starting maps? You just write down any two matrices, two by two matrices with complex coefficients, but you want to be a bit systematic. So now there's some mathematics here on the right. I think, let me try and explain a bit. Mumford and Wright found a very nice way to parameterize everything. Um, it was rather complicated. It's written down in the book in full glory. Um, they called it grandma's recipe, but it, so you, you don't want, if you want to explore something, you need to reduce the number of choices that you make so that you can look at something kind of a bit restricted, you might understand. So it turns out that if you insist the limit set is going to join up to form a loop, then actually its shape depends only on two numbers, TA and TB. So what are these numbers? Well, you take your two by two complex matrix. And by dividing through by something suitable, you can make sure it has determinant one. And then you add up the two diagonal entries and you get a number. So you get a number TA or TB. And what's written on the right here is an explanation for mathematicians um, as to why you only need these two numbers. Uh, so there's some normalization involved. Um, so if you take one of these beautiful pictures and you hit it with a, hit the whole picture with one Möbius map, that's a bit like just changing your coordinate system. You get effectively the same picture. 
So anyway, the result comes out that you only need to plug in two complex numbers, far fewer than you would think, and you're going to see really run through all the possibilities in a systematic way. So what happens here are some examples. They started doing this. So ignore the, initial, the, the sort of red circles in the middle of the picture, those became rapidly redundant, but for different choices of complex number for these two parameters, you can see you get um, different pictures. And it turns out that if you start, as you might expect, if you vary the parameters a bit systematically, uh, the limit set start, seems to move uh, more or less uh, continuously. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you plug in two numbers, two complex numbers, and it all just goes wrong. You get a mess that looks something like this. And <clears throat> well, in terms of what group, this is a bit like uh, doing some Euclidean thing. If you rotate by an angle, which isn't uh, a fraction of two pi or a fraction of 360, then you get a mess, everything overlaps itself. This is somewhat similar. You get a chaotic picture, um, a sort of non-discrete, a non-discrete group technically. Uh, the nice pictures are called discrete. So there comes the question, well, if I just pick two numbers, TA and TB, how can I tell, what's the difference? How can I tell, am I going to get a nice picture or not. It turns out there's no nice formula. There's actually no formula you can write down to tell which parameter value gives which picture. But these limit sets that had all these beautiful circle patterns turn out to be ones that are right on the boundary. So if you hit one which has a beautiful pattern of circles and you vary TA and TB a little bit, you either go to a nice picture, or if you do it wrong, you go to a terrible picture. And <clears throat> here is a picture, uh, a very nice picture done by Dave Wright. This isn't in our book. He did it after the end of the book, unfortunately. So in this picture, you fix TB to be equal to three. And you see this picture in the complex plane so we've got TB is always three and TA could be any complex number. And the colored points represent points uh, which correspond to um, discrete iterations. And you can see inset some of the limit sets in there and the points on the edge of this blue, the edge between the blue and the white, correspond to these beautiful circle patterns. And the stuff outside, all those ones would be at mass. So if I plugged in a TA value in the white region, I would get a chaotic, messy picture. And it turns out that the transition between these two things actually itself is a fractal curve, itself is a very interesting curve, um, which there are still unanswered questions about. So that's the kind of thing that I've spent quite a few years trying to get to grips with, and indeed there are ways of treating it. We hinted it just at the end of our book, um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I'm not gonna have time this evening to go into it. So we've gone quite far into mathematics. Let's look at some beautiful pictures. So these are some pictures that were made by the, um, the mathematics graphics artist, Joss Lays, who has a wonderful web page. If you just Google for Joss Lays, is the best way. His page keeps changing, but he has all sorts of different mathematical things uh, rendered in a wonderful artistic fashion. Um, so these are just a couple of examples. The one on the right is one that's um, framed in the London Mathematical Society. Um, 
from time to time, somebody writes to us about either something they've done or asking if they can do something based on our algorithm. Um, someone actually <clears throat> had an engagement ring made using the patterns. Somebody made some very lovely glasses, basic design, and this beautiful book cover that was made. Um, it's, a, I believe, a translation of some um, Buddhist sutra and the authors somehow came across our pictures and wanted to use them for the cover of their book. You might well want to do some of this yourself. So if you would like to experiment, um, there, are a, there isn't actually, I have to say, a very good website. Quite a lot of people have done this experimentation. Um, but here are two websites. Now, let me, I don't know if this is going to work, but just let me see whether I can manage to show you on my screen. Um, let's see if we can go to this one. Is it going to work? Are you seeing my screen? Um, this is the website. Um, this, this is mathematically quite advanced, but he does show you, he explains and gives you more explanations and a lot more recipes and some programs which I think you can download. So this is a nice website. And let me show if you want something simpler, if we go to this one, Are you seeing what I'm showing? White screen. Are you seeing Math Vital? I'm not sure this is working right. Okay, let me go back to the, sorry, let me go back. Okay, so there are a couple of places there that you can look if you, the, the one in German, it is in German, but actually it's, it's much more basic. And I think it's probably simple and self-explanatory enough even if you don't know German, you can make sense of it. Uh, what's happening to me now? Why can't I? Sorry. Um, Oh, sorry, okay, here we are. Um, I haven't explained yet why we called our book Indra's Pearls. So this actually came somewhat after we'd done part of the writing, but um, there is a, a myth um, about the Hindu god Indra, who was taken over into Buddhism also, to Japanese Buddhism, about Indra's net. So the heaven of Indra is supposed to contain a vast net, which stretches to the outermost reaches of space. And at each intersection of the threads in this net is a pearl. And the pearl reflects, so there's infinitely many pearls and in each of them, you see reflected all the other pearls. And in each of those, you see the reflections of all the other pearls and so on and so forth. And we just felt that this analogy was so precise as to what we're doing. Um, I actually spent quite a lot of time looking at various Buddhist texts where the, the text in which this, this is mentioned and this idea of kind of within a world, you see infinitely many other worlds reflected and within that you see infinitely many more and so on and so on is pervasive of the whole thing. It, it's a remarkable analogy. So, um, uh, sorry, something is, um, I had one more movie I wanted to show. Um, Something has happened to my...
yeah, sorry. I just wanted to show you this movie. So this is a picture called the Apollonian gasket. So this, normally you start with circles like this, you place two circles inside touching and then in the triangular shaped holes, you place another circle and another circle uh, and you keep repeating this. Now our algorithm produces this same effect by, as you can see, a completely different way. And this is showing uh, why it is a, um, why it is a fractal. We're going to, we're zooming in here. Now we're going to zoom in again. Okay, so I'll end there. If I come back to the right place. Thank you very much. And we have quite a lot of time now for questions. Thank you. Scott, you have to unmute your microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. So I hand over the, the mic now to Adrian, uh, Deputy Director, please, uh, to him for the quest Q and A. Uh, ask uh, questions through the Q and A section. I can see that there's a, already a question now. Question. Um, this invest. This is by Peter Morrison. Uh, this investigation of the parameter space and finding it has a fractal border. It seems to be similar to the uh, relationship between the Julia set and the Mandelbrot set. Absolutely. I, I didn't really say that at the beginning, probably. But yeah, the Mandelbrot set, if you've seen it, is an immensely complicated object which describes uh, each point there represents an iteration, a different iteration involving complex numbers um, involves putting a, a, well, it involves the map which is Z goes to Z squared plus C. And the only difference with our maps is that the, um, the map is not invertible. So you, because you've got a Z squared in there, two different points map to the same point. Ours are one to one, but we start with two different maps. So this was exactly what inspired Mumford in the beginning. Um, Mandelbrot was actually at that time, he was working in IBM, but he came to spend a semester or something visiting Harvard. And he was going around telling everybody about this wonderful thing that became called the Mandelbrot set. And that's precisely what inspired David Mumford to start looking at these um, slightly different kind of iterations. Um, it, it's different because behind um, there is group theory and actually there's, uh, which I completely suppressed, there is hyperbolic geometry in three dimensions behind the ones I'm talking about. So they are kind of the same to quite a long extent, but then they're very different as well. So. Question from, from me. Um, in terms of algorithmic complexity, which one is more uh, uh, which one takes longer to calculate the Mandelbrot set or the pictures that you've shown us? Or are they comparable? I think the, I think the Mandelbrot set is unbelievably complicated. It's more complicated. This boundary I showed you, of course, I'm really showing a kind of um, planar slice of a much more complicated space. Um, but it does seem to have kind of regularity about it, although 
um, neither I nor any of my students have been ever able to exactly pin down precisely what it is, but it, it does seem to be more regular. I, I don't know, um, I may have some pictures. If you can bear with me for a minute. Let me see, oh no, I did just, did it. let me see if I can. Um, yeah, here we are. Right, so here are some blow ups of this um, plane that I showed you in the colored picture. So you have to look carefully at the coordinates, but um, as we blow up, it seems to repeat, it, it looks as if it's more or less repeating itself in a more fractal way than a more regular kind of way than the, um, than the Mandelbrot set. And the points on the boundary are indexed by, well, really the real line, um, so the rational numbers are points where there are these beautiful circle chain limit sets and it shape of the boundary near those seems to depend on the continued fraction expansion of these different points. But as I say, I haven't quite managed to pin down exactly what it is. Um, that answers that. Of um, the um, algorithmic complexity, I mean, how long does it take to calculate these pictures to actually, I mean, Run, run these algorithms and then? And... Well, it actually doesn't take all, I mean, you know, if you do a good program and um, it doesn't, and you use some tricks, it doesn't take all that long. Um, it is quite hard to know when, what is hard is actually to know, the question of when you terminate is a problem. Um, if you want to actually find out where the boundary is. So actually what I've done is I, I proved some, abstract mathematics, um, which enables you to find a lot of points on the boundary without running the algorithm. So it can be calculated, there's no formula, it's a kind of point by point thing, but I construct certain rays that come along and hit the boundary, um, which works very well in these 2D examples. Um, when you try to go to a higher level, it becomes much more complicated, but um, there's definitely something there that one can do. It was a, so some of this has really inspired a lot of mathematics. So the boundary I showed you um, that we're talking about, it was an open question as to whether that was a, a Jordan curve or not a continuous curve. Well, a continuous curve without intersections. And that was finally proved by Yaya Minsky. Um, and I think it was partly because he actually saw the pictures that sort of spurred him on to think, gosh, this really looks like it's a, you know, uh, an image of a circle and eventually managed to prove it. Question uh, from the audience by uh, Tatiana Eramikeva. And she's asking, is it possible to use this method as three-dimensional model for geological research? Wow, that's an interesting question. All right, let me say, so I can't answer that because I'm not quite sure what's in mind, but um, there is a three-dimensional picture hidden behind what I'm talking about. So um, if you imagine putting hemispheres on top of all these circles in the picture, they create a pattern in 3D which is related to hyperbolic geometry. Now, quite recently in the last, well, it's been going on a while, but maybe 10, 15 years, people have started to use this 3D hyperbolic geometry as a way of trying to represent hierarchical structures for machine learning, for analyzing for doing data science, right? Analyzing large amounts of data that, that has some sort of hierarchical structure. So um, these pictures look at the, the circles look as if they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But if you really put in the right geometry, they're not smaller, they're all the same size. And then you can draw trees and trees and trees. And you can try and use that to um, find ways of representing 
data that are really very exciting and um, I think it's something that's going to develop a lot in the future. By uh, Tan Se Piao and he's asking whether um, did you get any communications from amateur mathematicians or students who discovered significant mathematical results directly inspired by the book? I don't think so. We had a lot of communications from people who've tried drawing, making the pictures themselves and are very excited and have made different kinds of patterns and different algorithms and they send us what they've done and they're very nice, many of them, and they've done it's more the kind of artistic community who've done things, I think, than the um, mathematical community. I mean, it's true that I think quite a lot of students have used the book for projects, but I can't think of anything that someone's written to me and said, I've proved this and, you know, it was really a breakthrough in terms of mathematics. You're not earning any money from these algorithms. <laughs> No, perhaps we should be, but <laughs> perhaps we should be, but we haven't done. No, I have been told that we ought to patent them, but we haven't done. Um, they're out there, and if somebody wants to spend enough time fiddling about to, to reproduce them, and the great thing about them is that you'll never reproduce exactly the same thing. You can always, you know, you have an infinite choice of what you do, so you can mess around. Once you've set it up to run nicely, and, and colors and of course, like this picture's got some ray tracing effects, so you can do all kinds of things, yeah. Yeah, does the underlying 3D hyperbolic geometry have any relation to knot theory? Yes. Um, who is asking the question? Do they know something? So, uh, read uh, is Shah, but then it says uh, Debashi is Gosho. I'm not sure whether. Oh, yeah, read is Shah. Okay, two. fine. Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course they do. Yes. So, um, okay, one of the amazing discoveries in 3D hyperbolic geometry. So, there's a whole story here which I've completely suppressed. Um, you can describe many, many three-dimensional manifolds. I'm going to talk like a mathematician, otherwise we'll be here all night. Um, you can describe many 3D manifolds um, very well using hyperbolic geometry. They have a hyperbolic structure, meaning locally, they look like little bits of hyperbolic space and they're, they're complete. Now, one of the amazing discoveries of William Thurston was that there are hyperbolic manifolds which are closed, which are, well, which, which are complete and which are topologically the complement of a knot in, embedded in the three sphere. So what that means is if you keep going forever, the stuff that's at infinity as it were, looks like or is a particular shape of knot. Now it turns out that the rays that I discovered to try to um, fill out this colored region in the pictures I was showing you can be extended into the region that was white in the picture. I'm not sure I can jump to the right picture, but the rays can be extended and the knot groups, at least in a couple of examples I've been looking at, appear along those rays. And I haven't quite got a complete proof. Makoto Sakuma and his group in um, Japan are also working on this. But yeah, it looks like what you can start from, I, I think I probably have to talk to the questioner privately afterwards, which I'm not sure is possible, but um, there, is, there, there is a very interesting connection. Um, it seems to me that you can get to knot groups in a rather interesting way, which hasn't been done before, um, using some ideas inspired from the, these pictures, yeah. From uh, Anton Fama, and he's asking, does the boundary reflect the structure of the group? For example, does it resemble a Cayley graph? Uh, the, 
I'm not sure, the limit set is like the ends of the Cayley graph in three-dimensional hyperbolic space. So you have to imagine hyperbolic three space up above and each circle as it were is, a, is associated to an element of the group. Well, you really, the fixed points, you look at the Cayley graph in the three dimensions and the fixed points of the corresponding elements are points in the limit set. And what you're really seeing is just the ends of the Cayley graph. So the pictures I've been showing correspond to not, not to co-compact groups, but to groups um, where, you know, the, there's a lot of ordinary sets. So the, the white part is, um, the fundamental domain for the group is, is not compact. And if that helps. Um. I'm not seeing the questions, I'm afraid, on my screen. So <laughs> yeah, well, you, you can, you can uh, see them at the bottom if you click on the Q&A at the bottom. No, 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 it, it's, it's hidden from... Uh, I think maybe, why don't you take over the screen and then I can, I can see more what's going on. Um, <clears throat> I can do that. Well, let, um, asking a question, um, saying, um, I missed something important. When you refer to the boundary, is this the boundary of all the tiny circles in the limit set? And is this boundary approximated on the screen by small enough circles that you get after iterating the mappings a few times? Okay, so there are, there are two things I'm really talking about. One is, when you get these tiny circles after iterating a, a great many times, in the end, if, if you were able to carry out that, at, that process ad infinitum, what you would see at the end would be the limit set. So most of the pictures I was showing were pictures of limit sets, the sort of black pictures and the fractal pictures that were moving around in the movies. So yeah, those are the results of iterating a huge number of times and only keeping what you see sort of at the infinite limits of the iteration. Now there's another boundary completely different. We go into parameter space, which is like the Mandelbrot set space, which is like each individual iteration is like the analogous would, would be Z goes to Z squared plus C and the different C values there's a plot of the C values showing you what kind of Julia set you get. So you plot the um, trace parameters that give you a good limit set, a discrete group or a non-discrete group. And those are, that gives you another space which has a fractal boundary itself. So it seems to be kind of a common phenomenon in, in dynamics that there's the boundary between sort of well-behaved behavior and completely meaningless chaotic behavior is itself a very complicated fractal type of shape. Questions, oh, a new question just came in. Um, an amateur question by an uh, anonymous attendee. What inspired you to do math and what kept the interest sustained? Ah. Actually, I just loved Euclidean geometry in high school when we first, I, I wasn't, I mean, I was okay at math in primary school. I wasn't the best. But when we got to doing uh, Euclidean geometry, I just loved it. The way that you, um, you're asked to, you know, show something, some triangles, isosceles or something or other. And there's this whole chain of reasoning which connects one thing to another. And it may be very non-obvious, but it, it's there and, and you have to discover what it is. And that just fascinated me so much. I decided I really wanted to study mathematics. Um, and then it got hard. And I think I really rediscovered my love for it when I discovered hyperbolic geometry and I got involved again in patterns and geometry. So 
that's really what sustained my interest always. We are no further questions, then I uh, pass back to um, our director, John Chita. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Adrian. Perhaps I can ask the, the last question. Are uh, any of these pictures exhibited in nature? In, sorry? In nature. I still didn't understand. Where are they exhibited? Uh, 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 in nature, the, the pictures they have shown, the Mobius transformations. Oh, you mean, you you mean in because, in natural right yeah. in a natural physical. phenomena right right uh, not exactly but they're very close you know you look you look at um you, you can find things that kind of spiral around like um so not not exactly but they they're very suggestive and actually this is another way in which hyperbolic geometry seems to be there um I, I mentioned machine learning and so on. It's also there in biological growth because um, it's a phenomenon of, of kind of exponential growth. You, you have a leaf and then you glue on some more cells around the outside. You, you know, each cell gets surrounded by a few more. And if you try and put too many cells around, then the leaf can't stay flat. It has to curl up in some way. And that's hyper, typical hyperbolic geometry. And that's why, uh, like leaves of, of you know crinkly cabbage or lettuce or something, are all you know have the beautiful patterns they do around the edge. So it's it's connected. It's not quite the same, but it, it's very fascinating. Yeah. I see. Thank you. There yeah. are some, there is a, a lady called um, Diana Samina, I think who has done all sorts of crochet designs. Perhaps some of the audience have seen them. There's a whole book about hyperbolic geometry done with crochet and she's made exhibitions about sort of all sorts of sea creatures and so on made with crochet. And it's rather fascinating and beautiful what she's done. Mm, I see. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so on, be on behalf of the Institute for Mathematical Sciences, uh, let me thank Professor Caroline Series for spending the past hour with us, uh, giving us a fascinating view into the world of hyperbolic geometry and, and the beautiful pictures and, and videos and, and formulas as well. And I uh, also like to thank uh, the audience for coming uh, this, well, this morning, this afternoon uh, for the lecture. So thank you very much. And uh, have a good day and have a good evening then. Thank you.